Okay, so it looks like it's time to get started. Welcome everyone. Um, so this is the start of the Vitus Gen 2 webinar series. And today's webinar, Europe is starting to embrace new disease resistant varieties. We'll explore new attitudes and changing regulations surrounding what some consider as non-traditional grape varieties. This presentation is geared towards a non-scientific audience, but an understanding of viticulture is necessary for context. It is also more relevant to the perspective of attendees from North America, but we welcome all international guests. My name is Raquel Callas, and I am the Extension Support Specialist for the New York Statewide Viticulture Extension Program. I'm also part of the Extension and Outreach Team for the Vitus Gen 2 project. So our panelists today are Tim Martinson and Bruce Reich. Tim is Senior Extension Associate for the New York Statewide Viticulture Extension Program and leader of the Vitus Gen 2 Extension and Outreach Team. Bruce is a professor of grape breeding and genetics at Cornell University and the project leader of Vitus Gen 2. And with that, I'll hand it over to Bruce. Okay. Okay, well, uh, to start off with, we just wanted to, um, to let you know that this is a uh, webinar that is supported by U.S. Department of Agriculture Specialty Crops Research Initiative uh, grant uh, to myself, Lance Cadle Davidson, my co-lead from U.S. Department of Agriculture on this project. And this is um, uh, the first webinar in the series. Um, and uh, it's run by our extension team, our very uh, able extension team of Tim Martin Martinson, Raquel Callis, and there are others on the extension team as well. Um, the focus of Vitus Gen 2 is on the application of next generation technologies, primarily DNA and sequencing technologies, to accelerate grapevine cultivar development. So, in a nutshell, let's see. In a nutshell, this project focuses on applying technological innovations in phenotyping that's uh, assessing characteristics of any particular trait of interest and in genotyping, studying the genetics of grapevines to deliver breathing lines with durable powdery mildew resistance and very high fruit quality and to better manage existing plantings. So we don't focus only on powdery mildew and uh, resistance and high quality, but we have other traits of interest as well, downy mildew resistance and uh, a range of other traits. Uh, we work on both wine grapes and seedless grapes within this project, raisin grapes, table grapes. Uh, the project is a four-year project with about six and a half million uh, US dollars in funding. Um, as I mentioned, it's from US Department of Agriculture. Our team spans 10 different institutions across the United States, and it's, it's carried out in coordination with a very important uh, industry and science advisory panel. Um, so with that background in mind, now I think we'll dig into uh, the meat of the subject matter, mat uh, matter, and we'll go to Tim Martinson. Thank you, Bruce. And uh, I'm just, uh, uh, okay, I'm just trying to share my screen here. And uh, there we go. Okay, um, so I want to uh, uh, kick this off by talking about some of the background. And uh, in particular, an article I wrote for Wines and Vines uh, to sort of introduce the topic uh, entitled The Frozen Genetics of wine, International Wine Cultivars. And the main points I wanted to make in this article are, first of all, that uh, all of our international wine cultivators uh, are, have uh, date from the Middle Ages and the middle of the Europe. And so uh, since then, they've been uh, undergoing vegetative propagation. So the genetics are really frozen back there in the Middle Ages. So this means that we have some notable weaknesses in these varieties, although uh, we really like them for their wine quality uh, attributes and they're the basis of a worldwide industry. So the main weakness is susceptibility to diseases that came in from the new world. So all of these diseases and pests came into Europe uh, well after these uh, varieties were established in Europe. 
Uh, and of course, the famous one is great phylloxera, which caused a, a great crisis in the uh, 1800s, but also powdery mildew, downy mildew, and black rot. So these are things that didn't co-evolve with uh, Vitis vinifera in Europe, and they're things that these varieties in general, to a greater or lesser extent, are highly susceptible to. And there's uh, a lot of consequences. So I want to switch here to uh, this uh, evolutionary branching diagram uh, that was published in, uh, uh, by Juan et al. in 2013. So this is the result of a project also funded by the USDA where they developed this, what we call the DNA SNP chip, a microarray that allowed them to simultaneously look for uh, and score uh, single nucleotide polymorphisms uh, in, uh, I think it's about 700 locations, if I have that right. So they use this uh, to construct a phylogeny, uh, talking about the genetic diversity and uh, origin. So uh, they looked at uh, several accessions from Europe, uh, a lot from China, from Asia, and then a number of different uh, species from North America. So again, the big uh, separation here is between muscadine uh, in the southeastern United States and the uvitis, uh, what's considered to be uvitis, the vitis uh, uh, genus. And uh, the notable thing here is if we look at uh, Europe, uh, what they found through these accessions was about three groups, maybe two species of, uh, of uh, uh, vitus there. So in Asia, we see 10 groups, 16 species. And uh, in uh, North America, we use 13, you know, 13 groups and 19 species. So, uh, so all of our commercial international wine cultivars are, de uh, are derived from this uh, sort of small slice of the genetic diversity that's out there. Here's another way of looking at it from uh, an evolutionary tree. This paper hypothesized that the center of origin was really in North America, and you can see the branching diagrams. And over half this diagram is branching points in North America. Uh, another third in Asia. And you can see this one in Europe is a very, uh, very small uh, and modest point. Um, so again, using the SNP chip, they also looked at uh, relationships between grape cultivars, uh, existing grape cultivars. And the thing to notice here is that there's a lot of very closely related uh, species, and a lot of them are either siblings or uh, have a parent-child relationship uh, with, with each other. And it's a very tight and narrow genetic uh, cluster. And again, uh, this is all a cluster of grapevines that are not resistant to, uh, to, to, don't have the disease resistance. So what's the consequences for this? Well, if we look at disease management in Chardonnay and look at the, um, the seasonal uh, touchstones that we look at, um, if you're in arid production regions, you have powdery mildew and botrytis to worry about. If you're in the east, uh, or other more human, you have the, the, these other diseases that uh, you have to worry about. So in New York, in the Finger Lakes, what this means for growers of Chardonnay is that they have to do 13 fungicide applications. Uh, more properly, probably 10 to, you know, 10 to 15 or 18 fungicide applications. That's an enormous amount that we have to do just to produce clean, ripe, disease-free fruit. So uh, recently, and I think uh, Bruce will expand on this a little bit, uh, uh, some of our uh, project uh, advisory committee members from Europe have cited the fact that in uh, many places in Europe, the vineyards are close by into towns, and this amount of uh, fungicide applications is causing some concern among the populace. So uh, part of the solution to this is to uh, have disease resistant cultivars available and accepted so that at least in areas close to these towns, then uh, perhaps those could substitute for the 
uh, more intensively managed uh, cultivars. And of course, um, a lot of this uh, is going to come from germplasm from North American vitus, in which these uh, various vitus species have co-evolved along with the pathogens that we introduced to Europe. So that's all I have to say with that. I'm going to pass it back over to uh, Bruce. Thank you very much, Tim. I'm going to switch it over. Hold on a minute. Um, Hang on, please. Okay. Bruce, try pressing the full screen um, button down there at the bottom. Yeah, that's the screen I've lost. Um, hold on a second. Okay. We see, we see your PowerPoint, it's just not full screen. Oh, okay. If <laughs> that helps. All right. Sorry about that. It's okay. How's that? There you go. You got okay. It. Okay. So I'm going to pick up um, the story here from uh, uh, from Tim's mention of um, uh, the development of um, hybrid grapes and uh, some of the difficulties that were um, were experienced in Europe in response to phylloxera invasion powdery mildew, downy mildew, black rot, uh, all diseases and insects endemic to North America. And um, uh, unfortunately, uh, inadvertently exported in the 1860s and 1880s to Europe. Uh, the wine industry there was, was devastated, of course, uh, with vinifera grapes not having resistance to phylloxera or the, these various fungal diseases. And in response, there was a great deal of innovation. Of course, they still wanted to grow grapes, make wine, uh, uh, grow all types of grape products uh, possible. Um, so there, was, there were innovations in disease control, innovations in grafting onto resistant rootstocks. Um, and in the initial going, they also turned to hybridization. Uh, to the notion of using North American species that had co-evolved with these diseases as a source of resistance to, to the diseases and to phylloxera and making what they called HDP, hybrid direct producers. Um, and uh, in the late 1800s, early 1900s, Albert Seibel was one of the first innovators, um, shown here in the lower right. Um, developing a large series of crosses with North American vitus and uh, working uh, very strongly in this area, developing large groups of hybrids such as the ones we know as Dachonac, Verdelet, Chelois, Chancellor. Um, often these were known by the breather's name followed by a number, Seibel 7053, Chancellor. Then these are on this slide, a few of the uh, individuals who were involved in development of, um, of uh, hybrid grapes in this period, late 1800s, early 1900s. Some of them are still grown. Some of them are pretty nice in quality, but many um, were not uh, considered to be high enough in wine quality uh, to persist a long time. Some had the um, flavors and characteristics still of North American species like Vitus labrusca, Vitus riparia, Vitus estivalis. So, so um, uh, there was still interest in returning to vinifera. And you can see how that charted out over the years. Uh, in the slide, I've borrowed some information I borrowed from Laurent Audeguin uh, from France. Uh, you can see this uh, topping out in terms of French-American hybrid production in, 
in, um, uh, in France, uh, 400,000 hectares in the 1950s or 60s. Uh, that's about a million acres, uh, hectares to acres for a North American audience, multiplied by about 2.5 to get there. Um, what surprised me actually by, by the numbers is that there are still 6,000 hectares of, of hybrid grapes, uh, many of them French American hybrid grapes, uh, grown at practically at the present time in France. And this kind of piqued my interest when I saw this chart uh, just um, a year and a half ago in, on a trip to France. Um, and that, now we come back to this notion of what's happening nowadays in Europe and, and in France. Um, and as, as you said, Tim, uh, many vineyards are right there up against the towns. Uh, many of these could be sprayed 10 to 20 times per year. And there's increasing concern um, about those pesticide applications right there next to the main streets of towns, next to, to homes, right next to the villages. So I became uh, uh, very interested in this topic. My, my interest was greatly piqued actually about four years ago when I spied this online in decanter.com, Bordeaux. Uh, Ducourt plants a disease resistant vineyard. So uh, this is a, a major holding in the Bordeaux region, uh, producing um, uh, high quality Bordeaux wines. And they devoted about three hectares to planting uh, two different grape varieties in 2014. So what are they? It's um, Cal 604 and Cabernet Jura. Two, uh, two grapes developed by a breather in Switzerland, uh, hybrids with um, vinifera and resistant uh, breathing partners, uh, Cabernet Sauvignon, uh, Sauvignon Blanca, and Riesling are in the background of these grapes. And uh, Ducourt was, uh, was very interested in this. Um, and, and going according to the letter of the law, he, uh, he says in his website that we can plant at least 50 vines and that's the upper limit. Uh, as long as the resulting wine is clearly labeled as experimental and bottled not under an Appellation Controle label, but as a wine of France, uh, typical geographic indication on this label. Um, and if you start then researching a little bit more what's happened since 2014, you start uh, uh, traveling around the internet and uh, uh, you find articles about pesticide drift in French villages and a proposal to create a 200 meter exclusion zone around villages. Uh, I don't know exactly where that stands at this point, but there's a great deal out there. So what, what are these forces really that are driving change? Uh, first of all, you have these embedded vineyards, you have the cost of pesticide applications, the cost of fuel, the cost of labor, uh, the environmental concerns, the health concerns. Uh, many of these are shared not just by the population in general, but, but also by the, the growers themselves, um, increasingly concerned about um, pesticide applications and what else can they do to, to reduce and improve on the situation. In, in Europe, this is an especially sensitive topic because uh, viticulture, according to a 2003 report, I was able to find viticulture uses about 40% of all crop protection products in all of agriculture in the European Un Union. So pictured here, I um, uh, have a, a, a nice photo of um, Valentin Blattner's Cal 604, one of the, um, the white wine variety planted by Ducour in Bordeaux, Sauvignon Blanc, Riesling, a resistant partner, unknown what that is. Um, and uh, by now I figured there must be a wine out there, and there is. Uh, it's bottled under the label Metissage, um, first bottled in May 2017. Um, this seminar will be recorded, so you'll be able to go back to these links, I think, and, um, and explore, um, read for yourself what's, what's here. But to quote from uh, the articles I'm finding, um, on the Ducour website, we can tell you that the results are amazing. We spray very minimum in these vineyards once or twice a year, using only one copper 
one sulfur spray, using only copper and sulfur sprays. The vines are healthy, the resistance is stable, and the wines are good. So also at this meeting I attended in uh, 2016 in Toulouse, it was the final conference of uh, Innovine. So you can see all the presentations from Innovine on this website. Look up uh, the, the proceedings of the final conference from 2016. Uh, from innovine.edu. And it was really interesting to me that not only did we have the 6,000 hectares quoted for France as hybrid grapes or disease resistant grapes grown in Europe, but Italy, 10,000 hectares, Portugal, 8,000, Spain, 4,000, Germany, 3,000. Percentage wise, these are pretty low numbers, but it's up to around 3% of all uh, grapes grown in Germany. Uh, that are hybrid disease resistant grapes. So very interesting to me what's, um, and, and my curiosity is, is even further enhanced by this presentation by Laurent Odegain. Um, and uh, so I added in here, what's the total number of hectares uh, in these countries? Uh, so you can see it's a drop in the bucket that are actually disease resistant uh, uh, hectares of grapes. But when you go to Eastern Europe, it's much greater. Almost uh, half of the plantings in Romania are considered to be hybrid disease resistant types, about uh, um, nearly a third in Hungary, uh, Bulgaria, quite a significant amount. Um, so, of course, curiosity leads to a little more uh, research and um, uh, somebody had mentioned to me uh, the PWI organization, PIWI International. Um, so I went online to find this organization. And uh, this is an, or, uh, an, an organization devoted just to the further dissemination of fungus resistant varieties. Its membership is Eastern Europe, Western Europe. Um, I believe it goes beyond those borders. I know of some New York uh, uh, individuals that are interested maybe have joined this, this group as well by now. They're interested in the collection, the exchange of information about disease resistant varieties. They're interested in encouraging the planting of these varieties and sharing information about how best to grow them, how best to make wine from them. So this is also happening out there. And everything I'm talking about is a result of um, classic hybridization, um, uh, classic crossing methods as grapes have been developed for many years. Uh, so Peewee is out there. And now, you know, let me spend a little bit of time on the situation in France. Uh, then we're going to pause for questions and then I'll complete uh, the seminar with uh, some additional comments about the situation in Italy and the situation in Germany and what's happening there in terms of the, the changing attitudes towards um, uh, hybrid varieties. So in France, um, going back a little bit, only you know, 60, 70 years, uh, 1955, grapes were um, classified as either recommended, authorized, or tolerated. Um, in 1970, uh, a decree was passed that hybrids must be in either the author authorized or tolerated categories, except Baco Blanc, which even to this day is a recommended variety for Armagnac brandy production. So it's a regional brandy production. So I have Arma, uh, Baco Blanc uh, pictured here, uh, leading, uh, uh, leading source of information on hybrid grapes in Europe, uh, in a sense leading the charge, still out there after so many years. In late 1970, everything that was classified as tolerated was then classified only as temporary temporarily authorized, replanting no longer permitted. Um, 1958, you remember there were over 400,000 hectares. By 1980, less than 200,000. Today, even less. Then what about um, recent years? I found some numbers from a book by uh, Kim Anderson, um, well-known uh, well economist, um, a grape researcher from Australia. Um, and uh, she counts in, in France, uh, Baco Blanc, 773 hectares, and some other hybrids are still out there in pretty significant numbers. Chambersan, 
over a thousand hectares, Vidal Blanc, Viard Noir. Um, so pretty interesting that these are still out there. That makes up, I think, a great deal of the 6,000 hectares that still exist. Um, I'm not an expert in uh, regulations, particularly in the European uh, Union. Um, I'm a breeder, geneticist, but I try to follow this story. It's so interesting to me. Um, as here in North America, we have pretty free reign on what we can grow, where we can grow it. So I'm trying to under, I've been trying to understand the situation in the EU, and this very much relates to the uh, adoption of new varieties. So since 2009, um, uh, there were some re regulatory changes that occurred about then. Wines may be made from uh, grape varieties that are on the national list of authorized varieties. Uh, approved varieties include those from vinifera or those now that are crossed with different species of vitis. And now we need some uh, definitions here to go much further. PDO is a protected designation of origin, like Qualitätswein from Germany, Appellation Controle from France, um, DOC from uh, Italy, um, and PGI is, is a lower level classification, protected geographic indication. And then we also have the terminology DUS, is a new variety distinct, uniform, and stable. So only vinifera varieties according to the regulations may be used in the PDO category, and hybrids may be used in the PGI category. Um, now DUS evaluations are carried out by experts. Um, these experts look to botanically classified new varieties as vinifera versus hybrid. So this is my current understanding, it may not be perfect. In France in May 2016, the official catalog uh, of varieties, this list, national list of authorized varieties was opened for new temporary registrations. If the work on DUS had been done, you're, you are allowed then to plant for each one 20 hectares at up to 10 different locations. If DUS is not done, only a maximum of three hectares. I'm not sure if that's three hectares per state or region in France or three hectares total or per grower, but I could only find out this much. But clearly, again, hybrids can be planted. So 2017, just a year later, following the alterations to the regulations, four new disease resistant varieties coming out of a breeding program in Colmar, um, uh, released um, uh, this breeding program, released two reds and two white varieties, Artaban, Vidoc, and uh, Floreal and Voltus, um, released by Christoph Schneider and Didier Merdinoglu at uh, Colmar. These are now carried in the official catalog of Antav. Uh, you can learn more at the website at the top of this slide. And in addition to the release of these new varieties, uh, there's a great deal of interest in the different regions to develop uh, local types. For instance, another cross is being made with these new varieties uh, with Pinot Meunier for, for possible use in the Champagne District or Syrah in the Rhone Valley. Um, it's recommended by INRA that uh, producers treat these varieties twice to three times per year, which is a greatly reduced spray program, uh, both to protect the resistance genes from being overcome by mutations of the fungus and to combat uh, secondary diseases to which they do not have resistance, such as black rot. So here's an example of one of these new varieties, Flor Floreal. Um, this, one, this one is very interesting. It has uh, two genes for resistance to downy mildew and two genes for resistance to um, powdery mildew. Uh, Run1 and RPV1 both come from the muscadine grape, but back crossed over many years into vinifera background. So you really do not get muscadine characteristics in these varieties. So again, you can learn more at the website quoted up above. And you can also surf the web a little bit like I did. And there's a lot of discussion in French media uh, here just from uh, Vitis Fear uh, website 
uh, 60 growers in the Languedoc region ready to plant 80 hectares of varieties uh, produced by Lam Bouquet, uh, passed away in 2009. Uh, these are the Montpellier varieties. Uh, 2017, about a year ago, 12 new resistant varieties officially uh, classified in the national, I presume this is in the national catalog. And here's an article about a tasting, a face-to-face -face off between the wines of resistant varieties grown, produced by Alain Bouquet versus those produced at the uh, Colmar station. Uh, these presumably the four that were just entered into the catalog and are being distributed now by Ontov. So, so this is where I finish up on France and uh, we invite, uh, invite your questions at this point. Thanks, Bruce. That was awesome. Very interesting. It's pretty funny. The tolerated <laughs> category is that we would never have anything like that here. I find that amusing. Um, but yeah, let's give people a minute maybe to type in their questions in the Q&A and we're ready for them. So. So Michelle sent us a question saying, do you foresee additional assistance in bringing some of these named resistant varieties into the US? For example, an expedited process from APHIS? Um, <clears throat> okay, good question about, um, I guess you're asking more about, um, are they here now or are they, um, is there interest in bringing them? So I'll be talking soon about some Italian varieties that are already here and uh, available for sale via Novavine, um, a U.S. nursery, uh, which is associated with the uh, French uh, VCR nursery, uh, Rauschedo. Um, the Inra Antav varieties, I believe they also have a partner I don't recall the status of uh, Floreal and Boltis, uh, but I believe um, uh, as, um, as opposed to being, um, having resistance to bringing these in, I think there's been interest in bringing these in and testing them. Uh, a couple of years ago, I was at the wine tasting in Michigan where many of these uh, wines were imported from Europe to try uh, due to the interest of Michigan grape growers. Very interesting. Thanks, Bruce. So we have another question from Michael who wants to know, assuming that fungicide spray programs and resistant cultivars vineyards can be reduced, then what is the estimated cost reduction in percent of total cost in growing a resistant variety? Um, Another great question. I, I don't have um, uh, figures in terms of um, uh, the economics. And I know in total, when one looks at segments of the uh, California industry, uh, Julian Alston has done some excellent work in this area where uh, depending on how fast a new uh, variety is adopted and depending on how large a region you consider in California, uh, there are millions of dollars of cost savings that can be real realized. Uh, of course, the environmental savings is something you can't factor into the um, dollars, uh, the cost savings of, of dollars. But um, uh, what I can tell you about uh, cost savings in general is that it has to be very significant in terms of um, uh, amortization of equipment, fuel usage, materials usage when you go from uh, 10 to 20 sprays per year to uh, two to four sprays per year. Sounds great. And we actually, I think Julian is actually attending uh, this webinar right now. So if he feels like adding on to that, Julian, you can raise your hand and I can 
allow you to speak if you want to elaborate on any of those points. Um, so we have a few more questions and Serena wants to know how are growers of hybrid varietals overcoming lack of recognition with consumers? Uh, Serena, um, another great question. I hope you'll um, hold on to my last slide in the presentation where I deal with the, the issue of acceptance. Um, so the short answer for now is that um, uh, every new product on the market starts somewhere. It starts as being unknown. And uh, <laughs> you have to take it from there. Um, and it's not uh, just by chance or by luck that new varieties are, are marketed or become successful. Uh, but Cabernet Sauvignon had to start somewhere, and that's a relative newcomer to the world of winemaking from only late 1700s. Uh, Muller Turgau had to start somewhere, late 1800s. Um, uh, Traminette is a much more recent introduction from our program, and I think most people would say it's been widely successful in North America. Um, so my, my final slide will deal uh, with this subject in a little bit more detail. Cool, so Julian has actually raised his hand if we wanna circle back to that cost question. Um, so I think, Julian, you should be unmuted. Did that work? Okay, can you hear me? Yep. Yes. Oh, well, good morning or good afternoon or good evening, wherever you are. Um, uh, just quickly, um, Working with uh, colleagues here, particularly Lena Sambucci, our estimates suggest that in California, the the total costs of uh, the pecuniary costs of, of uh, materials and application uh, of those materials to to control powdery mildew uh, in California costs about five percent of the total revenue uh, earned by the uh, wine industry, uh, and. Uh, uh, in some parts of the, the industry, it's, it's much higher than that, more like uh, perhaps 20% in the very vulnerable parts of the industry, growing Chardonnay in the cooler areas. Uh, that's still uh, 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 not large relative to the premium for the varietal name, so there are still those issues to, to think about. Uh, that's enough for me, I think. Thanks. Thanks, Julian. Okay, so we have a few more questions. Bruce, do you want to address them now or at the end? Um, let's, uh, let's wait till the end because I'm not sure if everyone would be able to hang on after um, uh, 3 p.m. New York time. Okay, so. that's, that's great. And also, if everyone who's posting questions in the chat bar can just do them in the q and I just don't want to lose them in the chat bar with all the other talk, um, but I'll try to keep track of them. So go ahead, Bruce. And also the, those questions that we are not able to, uh, to get to due to uh, time limitations, um, we, we'll capture those questions if they're in the Q&A section and respond uh, individually afterwards. Yep. Okay. So, okay, let's turn to the situation in Italy. Uh, and I just had a visit from uh, the, the new grapevine breeder from Vive Cooperativo, sorry, my Italian's not so good, Rashedo, VCR. Uh, whose partner in the U.S. is Novavine, um, and they have an entire catalog that they've just recently put out on disease-resistant varieties. Not only are they carrying disease-resistant varieties, but they've started their own breeding project, uh, which has to be looking at payoff uh, 10 plus years down the road. So, um, let's take a little closer look at the program in, at uh, VCR. Um, and, and what's happening in Italy. Uh, the University of Udina, there, there are several uh, breeding programs in Italy, but University of Udina and the Institute of Applied Genomics uh, requested registration of 10 new varieties from their program uh, about 2013. And that registration was granted for the Friuli region in 2015. And I believe due to um, uh, reciprocal agreements with the Veneto region, uh, Registration was also granted and cultivation permitted in the Veneto region. Authorization for planting in other regions of Italy is subject to testing and data collection, but they are looking to authorize planting in other regions as well as in other countries, and that's currently um, being sought. Um, 
So these new varieties have varying degrees of resistance to powdery and downy mildew. Uh, one would have to refer to their catalog or whatever you can find online about these varieties. Um, some, I believe there are at least four at this point that are carried by, by um, Nova Vine, actually maybe a few more. Uh, they, they have names such as um, Merlot Chorus, Fleur Thai, Sorelli, Sauvignon Kratos, Cabernet Eidos, Volos, Canthus, uh, Merlot Canthus. Uh, so it's an interesting group. I've tasted some of them my, myself. I'm, uh, personally, I'm very impressed with the quality. There were some of the uh, Merlot hybrids in particular that were very impressive to me. Um, so I don't know how much these are contributing to the acreage numbers I gave earlier, but, um, uh, but uh, these are certainly an indication of great interest in Italy um, in uh, planting of new varieties. And anecdotally, we heard from a visitor from uh, the Campania region not too long ago about visits to uh, various cooperators on the PIWI project. Um, so a number of people interested in disease resistant varieties in Italy. And then um, Germany in a sense uh, has been um, uh, also leading the charge in, in um, the development of new varieties, uh, both vinifera varieties as well as hybrid varieties, and in a, a different sort of approach to getting these new varieties registered and authorized for production. In fact, instead of registering these just for table wine production, uh, they have registered some of the new varieties like Regent, for instance, as vinifera varieties. Um, their claim is that they are indistinguishable from vinifera. Um, the authorities agree they are registered as vinifera and therefore uh, they are authorized for qualitate spine production in Germany. Uh, some of the examples of the names of the new hybrid varieties are shown here from at least uh, four different institutions. Um, and uh, I have a photo here of Johanniter, one of the varieties produced by uh, grape breeders at uh, Freiburg. And I'd refer you to this reference at the bottom of the slide for much more detailed information, excellent background information. Uh, written by uh, researchers from both Geisenheim and Garvalahoff together. So if you break it down, there's a really interesting situation when you, you look at what's, um, uh, what is grown. There are so many varieties grown in Germany, and this is all again in hectares, um, with something over 100,000 hectares of, of grapes grown in Germany. Um, Dornfelder is a Vinifera grape, released in 1979. Now it's grown on over 8,000 hectares in Germany. So again, this speaks to um, uh, the acceptance of new varieties. Difficult? Yes, probably difficult. Impossible? No. I think Dornfelder is now the number one uh, grape variety in, uh, number one red wine variety in, um, oh, I'm sorry, Spätburgunder is just above it. So it's number two red wine variety in Germany, very significant uh, area planted to Dornfelder. Uh, you go a little bit further down and here's Regent, um, produced by uh, breeders at Kavalhof, a uh, federal breeding research station. And uh, Regent has been out there um, since 94, when plant variety protection was granted. 1967, the cross was made. 1996, it was approved for, uh, for Qualitates vine production. And between 96 and 2001, it was classified and registered for use in all German uh, growing regions. Um, there's some regent grown in North America as well. Um, and there are many other new varieties coming along from various programs. So this is also very interesting in terms of innovation in, uh, in Germany. More than a quarter of everything grown are considered to be new breeds. Now, a lot of that is Muller-Turgau, um, and we consider that to be new. That's uh, Muller-Turgau was developed in the late 1800s, I believe. Um, so, but there are quite a few new red varieties on the market, and I've highlighted just 
two of those in this slide. Of course, uh, in the US, um, we're, we're used to the situation, uh, a little less so in California, but even in California, new PD resistant varieties are being pre-released for testing uh, as of uh, summer of 2017. Um, these, are, these incorporate genes for PD resistance from Vitus Arizonica and Dr. Andy Walker's program at UC Davis. And in uh, North America, we have Arundel, Marquette, Aramella, uh, as being moderately disease resistant varieties, all available. Um, Marquette from the University of Minnesota, Arundel, Aramella from the Cornell program. But also in California, re, um, table hybrid tel table grapes are being developed as well. Sorry, Selma Peat and uh, Duvine are, are not hybrid grapes, but just some examples of some of the breeding activity taking place in North America. So I promise to spend a couple of minutes on issues of acceptance. Um, and, you know, there are several uh, points I'd like to bring up here. Again, I'm a geneticist, but I think about this a lot. I, um, I have the um, experience of putting new varieties on the market. They start out as being complete unknowns. Uh, sometimes through the testing phase, we have grower cooperators and they come to us and uh, influence our decision when they say, when they come to us and say, you know, your Traminet grape is doing so well, we need to release it. Well, John Brahm and Herman Amberg did that, came back to us, we eventually released Traminet. It's been very successful in the marketplace. So my experience is in putting new varieties out there and kind of watching to see what happens, but here's, here are some of my observations on the, the issue. Um, I think the issue is, is something we have in common with the lesser known vinifera, but something that's overcome in many cases. Uh, years ago, Syrah was much less known than it is these days. Dornfelder was a complete unknown in 1975, 1976. Um, but is grown in very significant areas in Germany, as we just discussed. And Viognier and Alberino are grapes that are um, seeing, have seen over the last uh, couple of decades a real resurgence of interest outside of their home regions in Condry of France or in the um, uh, Galicia region of, of Spain for Alberino. So these are also varieties that, though they're pure vinifera, they, they share some of the same issues. And I don't think, uh, I, I think, yes, um, name recognition helps you to sell new varieties. I don't think it makes it impossible to get new varieties out there. Uh, Regenstart is complete unknown as well in Germany. When you have small amounts of production and just wish to sell right out the door direct to consumers, uh, some new varieties um, sell themselves and you'll sell all you can produce in the initial going. When you scale up is really when you begin to run into the problems, um, trying to break into the shelf space and uh, held by retailers and reserved for Chardonnay or reserved for Syrah or Merlot or Cabernet. Uh, in Indiana, um, they've banded together as an industry to market Traminet as their signature white wine variety for the state of Indiana. It's well adapted. They do a fine job making excellent Traminet products in Indiana, and they are actively marketing and trying to break the barriers to marketing uh, Traminet in Indiana. Now, not everything is sold as a varietal. So in blends, probably you can say there is no barrier to what you put in, in blends that are sold as um, under generic labels. Um, and can we say really that consumers will always just continue to look for Chardonnay? Will they just continue to look for Merlot? Or will millennials be different? Or will post-millennials be different? This is really an issue in sociology. Um, uh, I, I know little about, but I've heard it proposed that uh, the newer consumers are more willing to try something new. And finally, of course, new varieties, um, which have sometimes in the past been he uh, impeded by uh, 
uh, poor quality, they must be a very high quality to last. I think some of the French American hybrids went by the wayside uh, due to uh, inadequate levels of quality and quality is rather subjective. There are some objective ways to define, but there are also many subjective ways to define. Um, but new varieties clearly must be of high quality and consistently producing uh, quality products in order to last in the marketplace. Um, so the advantages have to be significant, um, not just in the vineyard, not just in terms of the environment or in terms of um, redu reductions in the costs of production, but in terms of the quality of the wines produced. So the Vitus Gen project focuses a great deal of energy on the quality as well. In particular, since we're sourcing genes from wild species, we're trying to understand the control of poor quality from the wild species so we can separate the genes for poor quality from the genes that we want for disease resistance. So that's one of our longer term goals in the Vitus Gen project. Um, I hope that begins to answer, I think it was Serena's question earlier. And I really thank you for, for that question. Um, and I particular, in particular, I'd like to thank Tim and Raquel for their work organizing uh, today's webinar. I'm going to end there. We still have some time to go back to, um, to your questions. I hope there are still a few more questions out there. Uh, this is the Vitus Gen team. I'd also um, uh, like to acknowledge um, National Grape and Wine Initiative and their outstanding support for this project from start to finish and their participation along with many others on our uh, industry advisory panel. So thank you very much. I'll wrap it up there. Thank you so much, Bruce. That was fascinating. Um, so I am going to quickly, before we get to the questions, just in case anybody has to duck out, I don't want that to happen before I let you know about the upcoming webinar on April 19th, the next one in our series, that's Automated Evaluation of Grape Breeding Progeny to Reduce the Phenotyping Bottleneck. Um, so that sounds a little bit more technical and scientific compared to this webinar, but I think many of you will find it of interest because it's about the new methods that we're using for the VitusGen project. Um, so we have quite a few really good questions, so I wanna try to get through as many as we can. So Bruce, um, let's start with Patrick's question. I heard that local European strains of grape diseases may not be as potent as North American strains. Is that so? And how might that affect the acceptance of these new hybrids in the US? Um, great question, Patrick. Um, uh, you know, I should be up to date on genetic variability among the European strains versus North American. Um, there is variability. They, the sexual stage is, is seen, for instance, with powdery mildew in Europe. I believe there's less variability. I believe you're correct in suggesting that. Um, if Lance Cadle Davidson is on, he could probably provide more details about that. Um, it, to me, in, to um, consider adopting any of these varieties in North America uh, would require local testing, not just for uh, stability of disease resistance, but also for uh, any other traits having to do with local adaptation. In general, these Euro the European grapes are not selected for the level of cold tolerance that um, some, of our, some of our North American breeding programs focus on. So uh, that may be a big unknown. Um, some of the, the varieties from Italy just use um, the, this current crop, uh, uses REN3 and RPV3, uh, which are some of the same resistance genes found in the French American hybrids. So if you're not finding the French American hybrids as a group to be fully disease resistant for you, these won't be any more disease resistant than the French American hybrids. The ones produced in France have new genetics, new genes coming in from the muscadine grape and separated from other uh, muscadine characteristic type genes. So um, that might be a more interesting group to examine, but again, they've been back crossed primarily into vinifera. So you would not expect to find cold tolerance 
testing would be, uh, local testing would be a great idea. Great, thanks. And Lance just uh, commented that you are correct about the reduced pathogen diversity in Europe. So thank you, Lance. Um, and now we'll move on to Michelle's question. Are these varieties, the INRA types, recommended to be on rootstock or can they be own rooted? Oh, okay, another good question. Um, uh, I, pres you know, I don't, I didn't read the uh, release bulletins carefully enough to, to know that directly, but I can be pretty sure with the very high percentage of vinifera in the background of these new hybrids that they are all recommended to be grafted. Okay, great. Um, Mark asked, Bruce, some of these disease resistant QTLs have been tested in North America. Can you comment on the level of resistance observed in that germplasm over here? Okay, um, Mark, I presume that's Mark Hart. Yeah. The uh, very thoughtful question about grapevine genetics. Um, the, um, uh, Mark, I think you're, I'm, pro I'm guessing you're probably talking about RUN1 and RPV1, which have been tested here. Um, personally, I find RUN1 to be uh, so far the strongest gene for powdery mildew resistance with which I've been associated, which with which with I've had the opportunity to test it. Um, run one is not um, perfect; it can be overcome. But in cases where I do see some powdery mildew growing on vines that I know to contain the run one locus, um, it starts growing very late in the season, and I don't see fruit infections. Uh, that's not to say they will never occur. And these are under situations with complete, under complete no spray conditions. For the first few years, our experience with run one was that we saw no powdery mildew, maybe a small amount on canes late in the season. Um, later, we identified Cleistothesia in cooperation with Lance Cadle Davidson. Um, we definitely see powdery mildew. So it's not perfect, but it's very strong. It holds it off for a very long time. Great, thank RP you, Bruce. Thank you, yep. Bruce. Just continue um, with, sorry, Raquel. Oh, sorry, go ahead. Uh, RPV1 has moderate resistance to uh, downy mildew. Um, it's, it's quite good in my book. It's not, not as strong as run one is for, for powdery mildew, but RPV1, which comes with the run one locus, they're adjacent to each other. Uh, RPV1 is an excellent source of downy mildew resistance. Okay. Awesome. Okay. Sorry about that. So another question, there's some people wondering about cold tolerance. Ken wants to know, are there any European varieties that will grow in the cool climate regions of the U.S.? Um, are there any European varieties? You know, in the Baltic states and in Russia, there's been breeding for cold tolerance. Um, I, I think the best ones I know about come from uh, 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 the University of Minnesota breeding program, Tom Plotcher, also as well as the Elmer Swenson programs. Um, Rondo is used in Northern Europe. It's a variety from uh, uh, the Geisenheim program. It has a little bit of Vitus amurensis, a species from uh, Northern Russia, Northern China, very winter hardy species. Uh, I don't know offhand, I don't have direct experience with Rondo. Um, we did not find, in our testing, we did not find Regent to be fully winter hardy here. Uh, it was um, winter damaged more often than its uh, Chambersan parent would be winter damaged. It's a hybrid of Vinifera by Chambersan, um, but uh, was definitely earlier ripening than Chambersan. So, um, there are really, what I discovered in wandering around and learning about the programs in Europe, is that there are so many new varieties out there. I would have little hope for winter hardiness among um, those that are just backcrossed into vinifera, where the backcrossing is just to vinifera recurrent parents. But I would have more hope where there's a higher percent of amurensis or other cold hardy germplasm in the background. Great, okay, and we still have quite a few questions, but I wanna just finish with this one more. I know we're just a minute over time, but Robert wants to know, I think this really brings together the big picture of Vitus Gen. 
He asked, can you outline your plan to screen new material you are developing in terms of wine production? How many separate varieties will you be able to evaluate for wine quality during this project period? And when do you expect to taste your first trials? Okay. Um, so in the Vitus Gen project, um, each individual breeder conducts his or her breeding program according to their desires and wishes. And there are table grape breeding programs as well within Vitusgen. Um, Vitusgen 2 is actually a continuation of Vitusgen 1. Vitusgen 1 went from 2011 to 2016. Um, we are already propagating in the Cornell program some selections from the Vitusgen 1 project. There's been too little fruit produced so far to be able to ferment those, but some of the genotypes where we identified which resistance locus was present and which ones were not, some of those genotypes have already been fermented for two or three years. They came from crosses made earlier. We then identified what loci were, were present, and um, we were we, we have some very nice um, results with uh, New York 06, 514 06, for instance, and we're starting to propagate and send that one out for trials. Um, in terms of the bigger picture, well, with the Cornell program, where we, we plant annually between four to 6,000 seed, seeds, um, germination runs on average about 80%. Um, over the course of uh, Vitus Gen 1, we, we screened um, close to 12 or 15,000 seedlings. I think project-wide, it was a little larger, larger number. Maybe that's the project-wide number, something close to 15, 18,000 seedlings in the entire project. Um, and it takes, um, from the time a seed is planted to the time you see fruit, at least three years. So. Um, and in that initial year, you're generally, you don't have enough uh, fruit to make wine. But we have fermented batches as small as one liter uh, from single vines, as large as um, uh, three liters or four liters from single vines. And as quick as we can, as, we, as fast as we can identify the elites, we propagate those to plantings with minimum of uh, six vines for uh, further wine experimentation. But then there's a further delay in getting those up and fruiting. So it's, it is a process. I can't give you exact numbers to answer your question, um, but I hope some of those numbers answer, um, answer you in terms of the scale of the project. And I think some of the main benefits in terms of development of disease resistant varieties come after the project while the big payoffs for the breeders in terms of new technology and the identification of new sources of resistance and better sources uh, for genes related to high quality or low quality, I believe that will come during the course of um, the project itself.